got 19 properties at the moment and I'm currently buying four more. Like the whole portfolio is worth roughly just over four mil. It was from a solicitor from New Era. So yeah. they was trying to take me to court. <laughs> a 13 year old. Thanks for checking out the podcast. This is From the Ground Up with Luigi Newton. Amazing. Luigi, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. No problem. Glad to be here. So just for anyone who doesn't know who you are, you're a property investor with a focus on HMOs, right? Talk, talk to me about what your business looks like. Yeah, so I'm from Nottingham, 28 years old. I've been doing property developing for like six years now. And yeah, I specialize in HMO conversions. So typically we'll take like a normal house, family home and convert it into a, a HMO ranging from four bed all the way up until eight bed. I would like to do bigger ones in the future, like, you know, 20 bed, 30 bed. Um, but so far, the biggest HM I've done is eight bed. That's kind of what I do. And yeah, it's going pretty well. It's had its ups and downs, but um, I'm still here, still going. And you've been doing that business for how long? Six years. Six years. Yeah. And the um, your actual um, journey up until now, um, you say it's been ones of ups and downs. Yeah. What has been the journey? Give me some context to to you. You say 28, you've been going for six years. What was life like before that, before you got into property? Yeah, so I think it's important that I just share it is ups and downs because I feel like on social media, a lot of people make property out to be very easy and like there's no stress attached to it, but it is can be very stressful at times. Um, but obviously the good outweighs the bad. Um, but before property, I was just pretty I was working in a call center I was selling insurance on the phones and that was kind of what I was doing for my career um I was trying to progress in the company that wasn't really seeing my value and I just started doing property on the side and then eventually went full-time property and I've been full-time property for around three and a half three and a half years now yeah now a lot of people know about property investing and buy to lets those types of things have been that concept has been around for a long time but you do hmos house houses of multiple occupation just just explain and expand to uh, anyone who doesn't know what that is or might not know what that is just explain what that is and and explain just quickly why you went into that because you haven't got any single lets am i right i've got one property which is a serviced accommodation okay um but the other ones they're all hmos yeah yep so you clearly were intentional about getting into hmos talk to me about yeah what they are and and why you chose them yeah so for me i love hmos because the cash flow is typically much higher than normal family homes so i kind of understood that from quite early on in my career my first one i did was like a, a multi-let property basically a small HMO, like a four bed, um, which I lived in one of the rooms and rented out three of the other rooms. Um, made load of mistakes, didn't do anything correctly. And um, yeah, big lessons learned there. But um, that's the reason why I like HMOs because the cash flow is much higher. I do a lot of joint ventures as well. So if I do a joint venture project with somebody, um, essentially we'll split the profit 50-50. So it works well on the HMOs because the profit is quite high. Um, so like on a four bed HMO, we can make roughly, well, typically around £1,200 net profit on a four bed. Um, so, you know, we can do a four bed deal for around 60K. It's, um, you know, £600 for me, £600 for my partner per month. And yeah, obviously it goes upwards from there in terms of the bigger the deal, the more bedrooms, um, the more cash flow and obviously it depends on the area as well but yeah that's why I do HMOs yeah so HMOs are houses of multiple occupation they are where you rather than renting out the whole building to one person or to one family you have different isolated rooms that people move into and they pay for that room yeah so essentially another way of um, describing it would just be you're renting the property room by room so you're re renting it on a room by room basis and you'll have like a communal area, communal kitchen, living area. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And you said that there was quite a lot of mistakes you made on that first one. I mean, there always is. I think one of the biggest problems and hurdles for a lot of people getting into property is they just want to get into it and not make any mistakes. But it's the people that are willing to make the mistakes and keep going and, and getting past those that can 
really get into it and succeed. Talk to me about some of the mistakes that you made and, and, and what problems that caused. Yeah, so I think a good message just to get out there is um, if you can't handle stress, then don't get into HMO conversions because they can be very stressful. There's lots of red tape. You have to deal with the planning side and the licensing side, which are two completely separate different things. And you need to make sure you have both in place. So yeah, my first property that I purchased, I didn't understand about Article 4. So where I live in Nottingham, that's where all my properties are. And basically the first one I purchased was in an Article 4 area. And basically I needed to have planning permission to run it as a four bed HMO. Um, yeah, so I was living in the property, renting out three rooms, which I then found out you're not allowed to do without applying for planning permission. Yeah. So obviously I changed it. Um, because I was allowed to have two lodgers because I was living there. Um, but yeah, big lessons learned. Now I understand about Article 4. If you're buying a property in an Article 4 area, it needs to be an existing HMO. Um, if you want to run it as a HMO or you need to apply for planning permission. Um, and then once it gets approved, then you can run it as a HMO. Yeah. But I didn't know that. No, no. But now you've moved on to building a portfolio of HMOs. You've got a service accommodation. How many properties have you got? So I've got 19 properties at the moment and I'm currently buying four more. Okay. Um, so out of the 19, 11 of them are fully let and I've got around seven or eight refurbishments. One of them's just finished and another one's about to just finish. So they're all at different stages. Yeah. Some of the projects are big. I've got one around the corner here, which is a seven bed with a big extension. Um, and I've got an eight bedroom, one that I'm doing with a shop underneath. But I've got a lot of four beds that I'm doing as well. So that'll kind of give you an idea around, around my portfolio. So across your, you've got 19 properties. Can you tell me how much revenue you make across all of them? You know what? I don't actually know off the top of my head. I'd have to like find out. Yeah. Um, but I know it's a lot. Like the whole portfolio is worth roughly just over four mil, uh, four million. Um but I think people, when people hear that, they might think, right, if I sold them all now, then I'd be walking away with four mil. Yeah, but it's not the case because I use mortgages. Yeah. So, you know, most of them have got mortgages on them. Yeah. So if I was to sell everything now, the mortgages will be paid off. And then... Um, and then you'd walk away with what's left. Yeah. And your deposits and everything. Yeah. Okay. Nice. I like that. But you, you really increase the value by putting them as HMOs, turn them into HMOs, increase the value from the... Um, rental side of things you know if you've got seven beds or more you're highly likely to get commercial valuation yeah sometimes even on six beds I think you've managed to do yeah and um, I'm exploring doing it on four beds too but okay. I know we're speaking possible. offline about that um, so I'll let you know how that goes yeah, yeah. please um, do but yeah but sometimes like on the smaller ones like a five bed or f I've never tried it on a four bed but I'm trying now so we'll see but on like a five bed I've had like hybrid valuations so, yeah, they don't give you a full commercial well, but they'll give you an uplift. So they might do purchase price plus works. So if yep. you bought a property for 150, you spent 50K on it, it's now a five bed HMO. They might come out and value it at 200K, um, which a lot of the time can make a deal stack up very well. Um, so it's not like the all money out deals, which I have done in the past, but it's still a very solid deal. Yeah, this is the thing with HMOs. People don't seem to realise. I I'm currently going through the process of buying two at the minute, um, and they they're not all money out deals at all. I, in fact, they're not even close. I used to have the mindset of if you left more than ten grand in, it's a bad deal. I'm leaving in about thirty k on both of them. No, no, I'm leaving in about forty k on both of them. But after all the all the costs and everything, the profit that I'm left with will make our money back in less than two years. Yeah. So it's over 50% return on investment, which is crazy in this market, but the high rents allow you to do that. I, ju I just want to quickly wind it back a little bit because you, you, you were in a call centre before you got into property. Um, did you go to university? Did you, did you go to college or like sixth form? Or yeah, so I went to college, studied business, but I didn't gain... I, didn't, I wasn't learning anything there. Yeah. Um, I'm quite well not quite i am dyslexic so um i struggle with you know written work and that kind of stuff i always have done um so yeah 
I kind of, um, I've always gravitated towards business from a young age, like from yeah. since I was like 12. What do you think sparked that? I think it's just my personality. But I feel like people either have it or they don't. That kind of money-making mindset and entrepreneur mindset, or, it's a bit cringy, but yeah, the yeah. entrepreneur mindset. No, it's true. It's true. I, I'm, I'm. It's also like you've got, at the moment, there's so many 12-year-olds that want to be entrepreneurs because they've got YouTube and they're watching people like yeah. Gary V or um, Andrew Tate, Al Andrew Tate, Alex Hormozzi, all these entrepreneurs who've become kind of YouTube hybrid people. Um, but we didn't have that when we were that kind of age. So how did the entrepreneurial side of you play itself out? How, how did that look? What was it that piqued your interest? What was it that you did? You know what? Since I was 12, well, I pretty much started when I was about 12 and I was buying um, large amounts of stock from like Alibaba, um, which is a website which you can buy different things from like that China. wholesale sites. Yeah, yeah, it's a wholesale site. So I used to import things, sell them in school, sell them on eBay. Um, I actually made some, well, decent money for a 12 year old. I made my first thousand pound when I was like 12, but I wasn't doing everything in the correct way. Because <laughs> mm. a lot of the products I was getting in were like, for example, Dr. Dre Beats, School Candy Earphones, um new era hats they did very well and then i came to realize that it was not fully authentic yeah there was like like, like copies products, yeah but they were like bang on one for one copies yeah um and then when i was like 13 my new era because i was selling loads on ebay and in person new era contacted um or they tried to contact me they sent a letter to my house and then my dad's opened it and um, it just said it was from a solicitor from New Era. So yeah. they was trying to take me to court. <laughs> a 13 yeah. year old. Oh, so man. My dad's literally called them and said, look, he's 12. Or like, he's 13. <laughs> and they was like, all right, we'll drop it. <laughs> we'll just we'll stop just selling it. Them. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they made me send back all my stock to New Era. What? Even you yeah, had to yeah. send you stock that wasn't theirs? That wasn't sold yet to New Era. Did you get paid? No. They just said we'll drop the, we'll drop the court case or whatever they was trying to do as long as you send me the stuff. I didn't know you could sue. Yeah, I, I don't know. Thirteen year old. I don't know what they were doing. Oh man. Okay, so you so you were spying and selling. This, that, that seems to be quite a common theme. I, I remember when I was in school, there was a bit of a bit of buying and selling. But I was looking online. I was trying to do a bit of um, it's, it's create like a clothing company and like all these little bits and side hustles that I do. And then you'd start to see. For me, my own journey was you start to explore ways of creating more capital, raising money, how to, you know, how to make money online or whatever it is. And you'd be Googling that. And that's when the YouTube people started popping up. And that's where I got into property. What was the first entry point for you into property in the property industry? Yeah. So for me, it was um, studying. I was just studying loads about it because I kind of knew from a young age around that people make money in property and landlords are winning so I kind of knew this because um, basically my mum purchased the property uh, for 80 grand and that's the house I grew up in and it's now worth like 320 grand or something so she was always kind of like rubbing it in my face a little bit like this is what I did and um, that kind of stuck with me so I always understood capital appreciation from from a young age and yeah so that was kind of in my mind and then I tried a load of different businesses. Uh, nothing was really working. Um, had some successes, but mostly failures. And then when I start, when I was working in the call center, I had said to myself, the only reason why I got that job was because I wanted to get a mortgage. So I took the nine to five so I could actually get into property. Um, so I knew what I was doing. I had a plan um, and I just, basically went ahead with my plan and it, it worked out so how old were you when you got the job at the call center i was about 21 so 21 rolling it back to then can you remember exactly what your plan was yeah it was just to try and purchase multiple properties it was just kind of so it wasn't really targeted really specific it was just i want to be yeah. able to buy a property yeah at that time yeah it was just quite um vague my plan but it was right i want to become a landlord because I know it's the best thing to do because I see my mum's capital appreciation and I thought, right, let me try and get loads of them. 
So I was more thinking ahead long term. From day one, it's always been a long term play for me. I knew it wasn't going to be an overnight thing. I'm quite good at seeing through bullshit. So like I was studying hard for the first year when I was like 21 before I purchased my first one. And I used to go on YouTube and like I'd be watching YouTube and thinking I can see through this. He's trying to sell a course here. Yeah. So I clocked that early how the business was running. Um, but then there is some genuine people online, like big shout outs to um, Saj Hussein, because he was one of the first people what I really found and I thought, you know what, I resonate with him. Yeah, we were talking about him, were we, off yeah. camera? Such yeah, yeah, a good guy. that's it. So like, to me, he's one of like the legends in property. Um, so I studied a lot of his stuff, and but I literally watched everything. Um, and then obviously I understood about HMOs. And, but I obviously didn't, do enough research because I ended up buying in an Article 4 area. But, <laughs> you know, everyone makes mistakes. I've made tons of mistakes in my journey. When I understood Article 4, I bought another one, which did have a HMO license. It was in an Article 4 area. So I thought, yeah, it's a HMO. It's an existing HMO. I'm good. Little did I know. Um, well, I didn't know. <laughs> it didn't have the certificate of lawfulness. So... I put myself at a massive risk. There was no COL. Now, certificate of lawfulness basically is a planning document, um, which is from the planning permission department, and it basically says, yep, this property is definitely a HMO. So I purchased this property, had no certificate, and when I came to did the conversion, spent like 60K on it. When it came time to refinance, we got a great refinance figure, but the condition was... Um, from HMO licensing, before they give us a license, they want the certificate of lawfulness. And I didn't have it. But luckily, I got it. Because you could have not been able to get it, and then you'd be stuck. Be stuck with a house that I've massively overspent on. Yeah. So luckily, I managed to get it because the person we bought it from, they actually gave us all the tenancies, the previous tenancies to prove, because you have to prove that it's been used as a HMO for the last four years. Um, so you have to have prove it with council tax, um, tenancy agreements, but luckily we had everything, so we was able to get this certificate of lawfulness. Talk to me about your best deal then. What's what's been what's been your favourite deal so far? Yeah, so recently I'm loving these four beds. I'm loving them. Really, because loads of people are like four beds a waste of time, ten beds plus are too much hassle, so the sweet spot is kind of Six, seven, eight. Yeah, yeah. And and I've heard you say six is your sweet spot yeah, before. Six was my sweet spot. So why is four? I think it's eye? because of the interest rates rising. It's made me kind of pivot my strategy a little bit because I'm always kind of pivoting and just just using common sense. Yep. When interest rates are higher, I'm just limiting borrowing. So the p- properties I'm buying now is like eighty-seven grand, eighty-two grand. Whereas well, your six, seven, eight beds are going to be two hundred k minimum. More like, just to buy the property. More like 160, 180, 175. And then the conversion costs are super high. Yeah, they're much higher. Um, but my favourite deal, my probably my best deal, was an all money out deal. Direct to landlord. It was an existing HMO in an Article 4 area. Purchased it for 170. Spent 60k on it. And then it got revalued at 335. Nice. So it was all money out plus about 5 grand. Um which it was a joint venture as well. So me and my joint venture partner, he got all of his funds back and he got around two and a half grand and I got two and a half grand. A month. Um, Sorry, as in as part of the refinance. And then how much does it rent for every month? So we're net profit in around a grand. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So you're getting a grand a month, which is good actually considering. That's each, by the way. So I get a grand and he gets a grand. Okay. That's even better than I thought. I was going to say, because interest rates are so high at the moment that 300 and... A three hundred and what'd you say the end value was three 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 five three three five. The interest on that's not going to be yeah low, yeah. is it? You know what it is, you know, because you fix it early. We did this before the rate started rising, so that's locked in on a four percent for like five year fixed. Nice. And you know what? It should have been valued much more. Um, what speaking, stopped it being valued higher? I think it's just because each value is different. Um, I say it should have been valued much more. I just mean my other value or what I use probably would have valued it about 380 um but 
we got all the money back out, so you don't want to over leverage anyway. I hope you're enjoying the podcast so far. If you are, then make sure that you click the subscribe button and the bell notification so you don't miss any uploads. It would mean so much to me personally and also really help us out as a channel. Yeah, exactly. It's just, yeah, you get more capital back out, but it's more debt yeah. to deal with. Yeah, and there's a project I'm doing now because everyone's always on about all money out, all money out, doing this seven bed conversion now. And I don't want it to be all money out because of the high interest rates right now. It just means the monthly payment will just be too high where the cash flow is not as exciting. Yeah. So in a way, if we get a high valuation, which I think we will, we will probably just say to them, um, we only we want to keep the keep that low to value yeah. lower. Yeah. yeah. I like maybe 60% rather than 75. So you do it. You've got 19 properties. Mm -hmm. You've got one. SA 18 HMOs. Yeah. Four HMOs in the pipeline. Yeah. So what 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 things have you got in the pipeline? Do you say that all four beds or a couple of four beds and five beds? Four. You're asking now. Off the top of my head, I can't fully remember. I think we've got like maybe two four beds, a five bed, um, and an existing five bed. Okay. And so, they're all in they're all in Nottingham. Yeah. How have you been able to pay for this? Yeah, good question good question there. So essentially my first few deals, it was pretty much my own funds and I'd work with investors on a small scale. So someone might borrow me, say, £8,000 on a fixed return and I'd give them back 10% on top of their money over a one-year period. Um, I still did that for the first few years, but I've now fully pivoted away from that. And now I do joint ventures. So I do my own deals with my own money, but I also do joint venture projects where my partners will fund 100% of the deal. And what I'll do is I'll do all the work. So I'll find the deal, manage the full refurbishment, manage the property managers on the back end, making sure everything's done correctly, making sure we've got, you know, everything is done properly, basically. And then we just split the profit 50-50. So I've done a lot of those. I do want to do more. I can't work with everyone. I'm very picky on who I work with. But I've got some amazing partners and um, it's actually more fun for me working with people rather than trying to do everything on my, on my own. Yeah, you, you go further together. Yeah, faster 100%. But it's, um, it is one of those, I, I'm the same, I'm, I want to work with people because you can just do so much more if you're working together. Also, there's so many people out there that have cash that they're just sat on. Yeah. You know, I was talking to someone this morning who, who has a quarter of a million quid and they're just sat on it. Mm. And it's just shrinking. Every, you know, every month, every year it goes by, the money's just shrinking in the bank. So to be able to say to those people, you know, you're busy with work, you run a business, whatever it might be, put put your money into a business like this. You know, we're both looking at HMOs at the minute, huge cash flow. The money that you can get back, the returns you get are amazing. Whereas I see people trying to, Say, you know, I'm, I'm looking for joint venture partners and we're going to be buying a, a single let. And you think, what? And they're like, yeah, so we're going to be buying this house, 120 grand. It's going to make £750 a month. And I'm like, I don't know anyone who's going to invest in that because, one, there's no opportunity to get your money back. Two, you're not even going to cover the interest rates at the minute. Whereas with the HMOs that, that we're doing, it's like a, it's you're buying them, renovating them, adding loads of value, pulling money out, and then the capital that you get from it it's just crazy. I mean, some of the deals you've done with your joint venture partners are amazing. And th and like you say, that, that one where you got to pull all your money out, actually, you were pulling all of your investors' money out. Yeah. So they get their capital back and they get cash every single month. Yeah. It's just and then amazing. We then went on to purchase another property, um, the SA one. Yeah. Um, with that same partner. But most of my partners, I'll do multiple projects with. So, um, but I think it's about having a preferred partner for me, preferred joint venture partner for me, someone what's relaxed um they're not super nervous type of person because i don't work well with that type of person um it, it also becomes stressful it, it also suggests a bit of a trust issue yeah if someone's thinking like breathing down your neck you know luigi where's the project up to how's the refurb going well you know you, you've asked me for more money for for the refurb but what's going on is a, what's the problem like mm. how's it going you think can't trust yeah, me yeah just chill i know what i'm doing yeah. so you work with um, investors, people with capital to build up your portfolio. What's the kind of avatar, your perfect ideal person? Obviously, everyone varies a little bit. Mm. What's the ideal person that you want to work with? Because you also can't work with everyone. There's, there's, so much, there's so many people out there, so much money out there 
And loads of people come to me and say, I've got money, I've got, you know, 10 grand, 50 grand, 100 grand. I want to put it into a deal. And like we were talking off camera, nine times out of 10, they're just not the right fit. What is it that makes someone the right fit? So for me, I think it's about mainly the first thing is their morals and their personality. You know, I like, I get on best with someone what's relaxed. They're not super anxious type of person. Um, someone what can handle adversity. And ideally someone with a little bit of property experience, um, the more the better really in terms of experience. But if someone doesn't have experience, but I get on really well with them and they have the funds to do something and I can tell their personality, then yeah, I'd definitely work with them. Um, so I am picky, but a lot of the time I speak to a lot of people and I'm never trying to convince anyone to work with me. It's one of those where, look, this is what I do. This is what I can offer. Um, if you want to have a conversation, let's talk. I'll just jump on a call with somebody. And most of the time, the people that do really want to do joint ventures, they'll pay the commitment fee straight away and we'll get to work. So pay commitment fee. How, talk, me, talk me through that. What's the, what is the process? Say, like, I come to you. I said, Luigi, I've got half a million quid. Do you want to work together? What's the process then? How do you onboard me as an investor? Yeah, so I think it's a case of having a conversation with you, um, either in person or over the phone, uh, typically over the phone because most of my partners are in London or overseas. Um, I typically work with like high net worth um, professional people, but not all the time. Um, sometimes someone might have some inheritance or something like that. But yeah, so the process would be conversation, get to know each other, uh, me explaining the process and giving all the details. And also I'll just send you my prospectus so you can see the past deals I've done or most of the past deals that I've done. And then I'd send a commitment fee document. This commit The reason why I take a commitment fee is because in the past I've been like six months in. Pulls out. Yeah, someone pulled out last minute on the week of completion. So it cost me money because I had to pay my broker, my solicitor for basically time wasting um so yeah that's why i take a commitment fee it's typically three thousand pounds and it's fully refundable if i can't find us a deal um and yeah that's what i do and that's like a holding fee so it's not profit to me that will get used towards a refurbishment or when we own the property i just send it back to my partner yeah yeah one of the things i like about joint ventures mm. on the whole is because loads of people have come to me and said just do loan agreements which I'm more than happy to do. That's that's a great option. And similar to you, you said you you know you take eight grand off someone, give them eight hundred quid plus their eight grand at the end of the year. Um, that kind of thing works really well. And I've I've done that before on previous projects. The thing I love about joint ventures and going fifty fifty with people is that it's one. It gives them more ownership mm -hmm. and they're more invested in it. It also makes it a bit more exciting because you're sharing the journey. A loan agreement might be that. You know, someone says, here's 100 grand. I've got a year to spend that 100 grand and I spend that how I want. And then they get that back at the end of the year plus 10%. Mm. If I say to someone, I've got a deal and they're investing in the deal, they're investing in the project. It's just a bit more exciting. There's a bit more emotional as well as financial investment into you, into yeah. your deal. But I think there's a massive downside which people don't really talk about on social media regarding the, the loan agreements. Because um, it is a strategy that developers do use. Um, I have used it myself. And I do actually have a quick horror story on that. Um, so... Go on. Um, never really spoke about this before, but one time I had a um, loan agreement with somebody for a one-year period for around 50K. And basically it was one year and my project slightly went over. So we was on like month 13. And obviously I'd kept the person fully updated. They knew exactly which project the, um, the money was in and where we was at. So we was currently, well, we was refinancing the property. But you know what it's like with refinances. Sometimes it's, it's just it's quick. delayed, yeah. yeah. Um, so this particular lender was being super slow and they just wanted us to get this report, that report before they released the funds. So all normal stuff. But for this person, because they didn't have any property experience, they got a little bit jumpy. And it's a mistake for me for not getting to know that person well enough before working with them and actually taking on that investment because they got very, very jumpy. 
And what happened was um, I got a knock on my door and came down and basically there was a postman there and he basically said, you've been served. <laughs> oh, no. Nah. So they ser he served me with a statutory demand, which is um, it's basically like an, an official demand notice that you need to pay this money within 14 days or it can um, they're going to try and basically make me bankrupt. Yeah. Now, no matter, say if you have, you know, like millions of pounds of equity, even if someone tries to take you to court to bankrupt you, it can still have negative effects on you, like big implications. Yeah. Um, it can kind of put a red flag next to your name in terms of when you're trying to get mortgages and stuff. So for me, this was major. So, but because the remortgage was going through, we got a really good valuation on it. Um, I knew the funds would be landing soon. So I managed to um, speak to the solicitor and basically say to them, look, it's coming in two weeks time. Like it's going to come, the money's coming. But it was proper stressful. That was a stressful two yeah, weeks, I bet. It was stressful <laughs> because I'd, I've never had that happen before. And I was just kind of shocked that, wow, this person's really not understanding the process. But it's my fault for taking on that investment. But yeah, basically the remortgage went through, paid him back. Um, and yeah, moved on from it. But it was scary. Do you know what? There's a, a couple of things about that. One, ownership, taking ownership and responsibility mm. is such a big thing. It, I was talking to my wife about this the other day. It's just mad how the people I see that are super successful in property or in any business are people that are willing to just take ownership. Like that was like the fact that you said that was my fault. Most people would turn around and say, "I can't believe that that guy did that." He he, and you go, "Do you know it's my fault? Should have I should have chosen him better." Yeah, and you own what you can do better, which is why I can imagine. And just the other point I want to make that's probably why you're really picky with who you work with now. Someone could come to you and say, I've got a quarter of a million quid. Yeah. You're not going to touch it if it's the wrong person. That's it, 100%. If someone's like super high anxiety and like, you know, their expectations is off, that's another problem with doing the joint ventures. Not a problem, but it's something people need to be wary of if you're looking to do joint ventures. Set the expectation realistically because I get so many people, they've seen me on Instagram doing an all money out deal I've done multiple all money out deals. Yeah. And but I not have, everyone. Yeah, and I have like posted them posted about them on like Instagram. So people see that, they reach out and they think, yeah, great, all money out. I'm gonna get all my money back out plus a thousand pounds each per month net profit. Great, let's go. And I have to really take it down a notch, bring it back down to reality and say, look, this is rare. All money out deals are rare. Most of the time we're gonna be leaving in um a big chunk of money. Um, typically, um, my partners would leave in 50% or less. Um, of their original investment. Of their original investment on the first refinance. So a lot of the time they'll be leaving in, say, 30% of their initial investment, 20%, sometimes 40%, 50% of their initial investment. Um, so typically, that's kind of how it works, really. Um, but on the HMOs, because the cash flow is high and the profit is good, that can the get return on investment quick. is really high. So yeah, yeah. That's what it's all about, the return on investment. Yeah, and that's it. If someone leaves in 24 grand, but they're getting paid a thousand pound a month, then they, then all their money's back out in two years and then they're getting a thousand pound a month. So yeah. some people, I think, just need to calm down a little bit. Yeah, yeah. What do you think about, just, just pivoting a little bit on the conversation, you run a training business, right? Or like a co you do a bit of coaching. Yeah, so I run a mastermind group. Uh, yeah. It's called the High Performance Academy. Um, we tried to make it affordable. So it's like £55 a month at the moment. Um, and yeah, we have about 75 members. I run it with my business partner, Sean Davis. Um, so he does rent to rents. So he's got about 50, 55 rent to rent deals. And he does social housing as well. Um, and I'm obviously, I do purchasing. I don't do rent to rent. I've dabbled in it in my early days, but it wasn't for me. I knew for me, I want to get ownership and purchasing. So there's two different sides to it. I'm on the buying side, Sean's on the rent to rent side, and we've both sourced multiple deals as well. So in the mastermind group, we cover a lot. Um, and we're doing a retreat in Marbella on the 15th of September. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. So that's going to be good fun. And um, we're doing like workshops. Getting... How many people are you taking to that? Um, we've got about 15 people. Yeah, we wanted to keep it quite small. 
um, for the first one. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. That'd be cool. So, and then we, because we were obviously talking about, I do a bit of education as well. I do kind of teach people how to do deal sourcing and, and, and finding below market value deals and that sort of thing. There's a bit of controversy, well, more than a bit, especially over the past few years around property education. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on being someone in that space? Yeah. What are your thoughts and experience of that? Yeah. So I don't actually offer any training courses or anything. I literally just have the mastermind. Um, but my thoughts on education, property education, I think it's great. I think it's really, really good. But what I don't like about it is when people miss sell and they basically make things out to be super easy. For example, rent to rent. It's a breeze. It's so easy. Buy my course and I'll show you exactly how to do it in, in, in two weeks or I don't know what they say, but yeah, that's what I've got a problem with because it's there's young people watching that and it's like you're sending the wrong message to young people and we live in the instant gratification world. Everyone thinks, yeah, I'll buy the course and I'll be successful straight away. It does not work like that. No. Like it's hard. Property is hard. It takes years till you actually see real money from it. So I think that's the message I want to come across with is the realness and the authenticity because I, I think it's lacking in the education space. Yeah, yeah. Because we could have jumped on here and you could have just talked all day about all your money out deals. Yeah. We've pulled every single last yeah. penny out of the deal. But that's not the reality. That's not me. Of I your portfolio. Yeah, like I can't be fake. Yeah. I can't come online and be fake. Like it doesn't sit right with me. And like the biggest compliment I've ever got from subscribers or whoever is like, Luigi, you're very authentic. You share the good and the bad. Mm. So I'm going to keep that energy the whole the whole way through my career. I want to go on till I'm, you know, older. Yeah. So you, you say that it's... Property education is good. Yeah. What's What do you think is good about it? What What do you think, I think is if the you positive? Can, yeah, I think if you can have a conversation and, like, just a, basically a real conversation with someone that's actually doing and is actually successful in whatever you want to do. So, for example, if you want to do rent to rent social housing and you manage to have a conversation with like Sean Davis, for example, who specializes in that, that's definitely going to benefit you. Yeah. Um, so I think like paying for a, a mentorship call or I think mastermind groups are good or just or a training program. They're good as well. But I don't see how people can spend £10,000 on a course and um, justify that in their own head. Yeah. Use your common sense. That's a deposit for a house. Yeah. Don't do it. Don't don't spend ten grand on a course. You know, um, I never did. I, I have paid people for like conversations so I can learn and pick someone's brain. So I used to pay a, a guy like £150 an hour, um, probably did about seven or eight sessions with him. That was massively beneficial for me. Um, and then I used to go to some one-off events, like one-day events. I've seen Grant Cardone speak before. I've seen Alan Sugar speak about business and stuff. So I have done lots of like networking uh, events, but these are cheap, like £100 here and there. So I never overspent on education because a lot of good stuff's on YouTube, like your channel, my channel, listening to this. You can learn. Yeah. But if you need additional support, reach out to, to someone that you know is actually doing it and ask them if you can pay them for their time. Yeah, and it's coming with, with value, isn't it? Because actually, there's so many people out there that want to educate <laughs> and want to teach people who are hungry, who are willing to actually put the work in. It's weird where the education system, we were saying that we both went and studied business at college i don't remember a thing that i learned when i studied business probably because i was being taught by a teacher not a business owner and it's just it's just interesting that that same thing can kind of be repeated in businesses across the country you can have people that are educators who aren't actually doing what they're teaching um and that's where it's a problem. But when someone's teaching something that they know, that they're experienced in, that they've got a proven track record in, I do think it's really, really valuable. One of the best ways that I learn, and this is where I've, an approach that I've taken is, is one, if there's foundational information that I need to know, I'll pay for a course. 
because I just need to I just need the foundational information. If I want to really deep dive into something and I want to speak to an expert, I think, right, how can I get in front of this expert and present them with value? So for example, the first flip I ever did was joint venture because there was a guy I knew who'd flipped 300 houses. So I said to him, look, if I pay for the house, would you pay for the for the refurb? And then we sell it and split the profit. They went, yeah, sure, let's do it. Because not only, because he didn't have to do that. He didn't need my money to buy the house. But he did it because one, it was mutually beneficial. Two, he saw something in me that was willing to take action and really go for it and put my money where my mouth is. And I think when someone's wanting to learn, I think one of the best ways you can do that is through things like joint venturing mm. or, or, or paying for people's time because you're going, right, what's going to actually give this person value? The amount of people that message me and say, can I jump on a one-to-one call with you? And I go, yeah, sure. Mm. That'd be 150 quid, 200 quid, whatever it is for an hour. Mm. For me, that's because that's what my time is worth. To give up an hour of my day is worth that much money. And they're like, the amount of people that say, oh, sorry, that's that's not for me. You just think, come on. Yeah. Like, if you're not willing to put 200 quid in mm. to get an hour of bespoke, direct info and, and training into your business and where you're at, I don't think you're, you're ready for it. Yeah, because if you approach like a different professional, for example, like, I don't know, a uh, planning consultant or like a you wanted a one-to-one with a doctor or, I don't know, any other yeah. professional you typically would pay that kind of price. So why is it any different for someone like me or you? We've been through shit. We've learned the hard way. We've had ups and downs. We've put years into the game. So yeah, of course, get in your pocket and pay if you want to talk. Because I'm I'm crazy busy. Um, but those same people might just get sold to on a course mm-hmm. for like free grand. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know where some people's heads up, but just use your common sense. Yeah, yeah. So So... I want to give um, the people listening, watching, mm-hmm. an opportunity to kind of get a bit of an idea of where to get started. Okay. So I'll give you two kind of avatars, two examples. There might be someone here watching who has loads of time, might be quite young, just in their first job or whatever, and they've got loads of time, spare time that they can invest in stuff, but they haven't got a lot of capital. Mm-hmm. And then there might be other people who have loads of capital, but not enough time. For those two people who want to get into property or they want to make their money grow and, and don't let it shrink in the bank, how would you suggest they get started? Yeah, so what I would suggest is for someone that's got little to no money, um, what I would suggest is they really get on top of the studying and really get, if they are serious about wanting to get into property, you have to put in the work. And the initial stage is when you don't have any money, um, and this is coming from experience. I've been fully broke myself and I was very, very hungry to learn. And I obsessively studied um, every single night. You know, this is not something what you should just take lightly. You should actually be serious about learning and studying your arse off, basically. Um, maybe put your social life on hold and just get locked in on learning. And I'd recommend people do this through YouTube, through watching both our channels. There's a load of good channels out there. Um, just watch watch them all if you have to and um also books um the first book i'd say is rich dad poor dad just to get your mind right um your mindset around money and mortgages and leveraging good debt and then there's one other book as well by rob moore and mark comer called the 44 secrets of property investing i read that quite early on that was really helpful i haven't read that much it's good yeah it's good yeah it's really good they might have like an updated version or something um but i struggle with reading books because obviously i'm dyslexic so for me it was podcasts youtube that's where i learned the most and then also make friends with other developers if you can now obviously this is not as easy for everyone but you know try yeah i've had one of my best mates now i met him because he reached out to me about five years ago saying can i work with you can i work for you in exchange for knowledge about property and i was like yeah, like, I like this guy already, you know? That shows he's committed. He wants to learn. He's trying to help me provide value, just like you were saying. So that's a good idea, what you could do. Um, find, like, a local developer. Um, so, yeah, that's one thing. But I'd just say for people, it's about learning and saving and trying to increase your income so it's easier to save. That's another tip. So take a side job. Take more hours at work. 
um, if you have any additional jobs you can get work free jobs if you have to scrape it together you know speak with your friends family see if anyone wants to put their money with your money and then do something um obviously just be careful with what you do with that um so yeah that's that person the person with loads of money but not enough time i would say they need to make a decision on do they want to kind of risk things if it's their first project and do everything themselves or do they want to team up with an experienced developer um and do some sort of joint venture um because then yeah it would be less risky for them basically because it's so easy to go wrong in property yeah like you say the value thing is so important like if if someone starts with loads of capital coming to a joint venture is way easier yeah because you've got a very clear level of value that you're bringing you're literally funding the project and for someone who wants to get started who doesn't necessarily have the capital if they've got no knowledge they bring no value to the table. Yeah. So I think it's a really good point you mentioned there. If you've got no capital, but you've got loads of time, yeah. just get stuck in because you can grow your knowledge, grow your your value, and then bring it to the table. Even if it's just for a 25% share, then when you get your experience up, you then start negotiating, right, now let's go 50-50. Yeah. Um, and a common question I get, a lot of people always ask me, how do you find joint venture partners? And I think to be fully transparent, I don't go out and find anybody. They typically will come to me through social media. And I understood that from quite early on, that if you want to raise finance, you want to work with investors or joint venture partners, you have to put yourself out there and you have to showcase what you're doing in an authentic way. And people will, the right people will gravitate towards you. Yeah. Um, so that's what I've been doing over the last five years, uh, six years. And yeah. That's where I find all my partners. If you're interested in property investing or you want to start and scale a property business, then I'm running some training to teach you how to do that very, very soon. I teach people how to build a six-figure sourcing business. I teach people how to flip houses and make huge profits. And I also teach people how to start and scale their own property investment portfolio. If that sounds like the kind of thing you'd be interested in, click the link in the description and you can find out more. It would genuinely be an honor to be able to help you. Yeah, because it's, it's almost like it's, it's not a sales tactic. It's more just, I use the same thing with sales. If I want to sell something, I don't want to sell it to somebody. I'm not wasting my time selling it to somebody who doesn't want it. So I'm not going to go out and find someone. I want to market my product or service and let them come to me. So if I want to, pick up an investor again the same thing we i talk about right i'm going to be buying up a few projects this year so if someone wants to come to me and uh and they say right i've seen your videos i know you're looking for capital let's have a conversation i'd rather it start there than go hey have you got money and it just it just it's, it just sets the conversation up in the wrong way it also means that you're having conversations with people that are actually ready and willing to part with their capital mm to then make a profit they understand what they're getting into you're not having to educate them or or kind of explain to them what the process is they understand yeah i'm putting in 200 grand for this deal uh, and i know that i'm going to get a return on this the headspace is complete and the conversation that you get to have is completely different because they come at it from a completely different headspace yeah 100 percent. so i mean i want to wrap it up um in a couple of minutes but tell me luigi about your like what's your why? What's your goals? What 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 do you want to achieve over the next few years? Yeah, so for me, um, I'm very big on goal setting. So I have like yearly goals that I'm working towards. And this is not just business. This is personal goals, business, uh, fitness goals, loads of different types of goals. And I have it on my screensaver on my phone right there. Um, and that really helps me hit the goals. Because when you write down a goal, you're way more likely to achieve it. Um, but my why is... You know, building a big portfolio, high cash flow and portfolio. Um, I would like to eventually get into doing bigger projects. So, you know, apart building apartment blocks, that would be something what I'd really look to do in the future. I will do in the future, um, but it's all God's timing. So, um, you know, when the time's right, it will happen. I'm not really stressing that. Um, but yeah, that's it. That's my why is... Um, yeah, just being in a very good financial position, having the freedom to be able to, you know, fly out wherever I want, whenever I want. Why do you want that? I just enjoy traveling a lot. I love to travel. That's like my, one of my big passions in life. Um, 
But yeah, that's that's pretty much my why. Yeah. Just that freedom. Yeah, definitely like freedom and being able to support my loved ones and yeah, my family and it's interesting. A lot of people get into this and I basically see usually two two different types of people. You get one type of person, and I love working with them because it's the same as me and the same as you. Freedom. It comes down to like, I want to build something with that creates a legacy. I want to create something big. I want to create something with mission and purpose. Like for you, you want to support your family. For me, I'd love to set up uh, and, and support my family. I'd love to support my local church. And like, do you know what I mean? There's like purpose behind what I'm doing. And, and ultimately, what I really want to do is create freedom for me, but also for people around me. And I love that because I can relate to that. That's me. That's where I sit. There's so many people in, and more and more actually coming into the industry who are like, I want to get into property because I want a Rolex, mm. because I want to drive a Ferrari, because I want the expensive things in life. What's your opinion? Because you, you didn't say, you know, my goals are to have a Lambo. My goals are to have this luxurious lifestyle. It's just like a core essence of freedom. What? What are your thoughts around that? Yeah, so I think people want overnight success. They just want it to be quick and fast. But they need to understand, if anyone's got that mindset, that things take time. You know, with property especially, if this is the vehicle that you want to, you know, become wealthy and successful through, then they really need to understand it's going to take a few years till you even really feel um, the, the wealth and the money, really. So keep that in your mind. And also, I'd say... A lot of people are trying to live above their means because they want validation from other people to feel good about themselves. And that's probably something they need to work on internally, you know, do some deep work and find out what is this? Where is this coming from? Um, Because material stuff will not make you happy like that. So, yeah, it would be great to have like a really nice car or something like that. But that can come later. Once you've put in the work, once you're very steady and stable, you've got very high cash flow, then you can start looking at doing all these nice, luxurious things. Yeah. But I just think a lot of people are just trying to, you know, live way above their means. And you know, uh, Warren Buffett, he's one of the people I've studied from very early on. Um, he always says, live below your means. And he's, he's, he was the richest man in the world at one point. He then gave away half of his wealth to like charity and stuff. But um, he has the same car. Like his car is just a a banger. And he lives in the same house, humble house. He don't live in a mansion. And um, he eats McDonald's every day to save money. (laughs) I don't recommend that. He he drinks Coke all the time, did he? Or like like, um, Elon Musk. Doesn't he live in like a, a one bed, almost like ground floor apartment in the car park of Twitter? Or something like that. He lives in this tiny little. He he lives in this tiny little box because he just wants to be at work all the time. He's not bothered about yeah the flashy life. Yeah, definitely. And I just think when you get a bit older as well. Like when I was probably twenty one, I was more bothered about what people think. I was probably more anxious and more just too concerned with other people rather than you know what really matters. So when you do get older, if you do do the work on yourself, like I'm a big advocate on therapy. I think it's very helpful for probably the majority of people to do it um obviously there's a cost to that but Mm -hmm. start learning about yourself and it will help you um just to become more happy i think yeah 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 do you know what that's actually a really good point i spent quite a significant amount of money on um it wasn't like therapy it was more like um it was a bit like counseling, but kind of just to understand how my brain works mm. and understand why I am the way I am. And yeah. um, they use this thing called Strength Finders, mm-hmm. um, which is a bit like this, um, you know, like Myers Briggs, the kind of personality tests and stuff. Yeah. So they use that as a bit of a foundation, work out what your strengths are. And they talk about how you can build on that and how actually a lot of people see certain things not as a strength, but they actually are if they're used in the right way. And there's so much about yourself that you don't know yeah so to have that kind of work with someone to uncover that is so helpful and you start exploring childhood and you realize that your childhood affects the way you are as an adult 
there's so much to learn mm. there's so much and it will help you in your business as well yeah and like even things like looking after your health and your fitness if you people get onto that they tick that box it will rub off on their business because they've got more energy they're more on point they feel better in themselves they're more confident so everything's interlinked um so i think people don't just focus on just your business focus on all areas of success but um also put in the work like a lot of the young people the work ethic's not there and i don't know exactly why it's like that but i think the majority of young people maybe i'm being too negative here but the work ethic is not where it should be and they give up easy they want things quick i think it's linked to social media we're seeing you know every person on social media being flashy showing off what they got and they think yeah cool i can have that in yeah. a week yeah. yeah yeah and then these course sellers that are selling certain courses in a certain way it it's not giving the right message to young people mm. we need yeah. more authenticity in this space yeah and i think it, it kind of is the differentiation between someone saying i want to be rich and someone saying i want to be wealthy yeah if you want to be rich you a lot of the time you fall into that i want to be rich quick and i want huge amounts of money and i want to just be able to go out and spend it and their, their their dream is to spend whereas for people who have like this wealthy mindset their dream is to invest and their dream is to have that freedom of actually it's more important to have i would rather have 10 houses that gave me a 60 grand a year income that was just guaranteed fixed for the rest of my life and i didn't and i had the freedom that we're talking about than to have a mega business that made millions but had to absolutely slog my guts out forever and actually in order to get that kind of freedom and to build up that portfolio it does require work it's not quick it's not a get rich quick thing but you can get there and it creates that wealth of lifestyle that maybe you kind of refer to there with like health with your mindset with your emotions but also financially as well yeah because jack when i was on like two or three properties or four it was much easier to manage it was like yeah cool i was like yeah winning yeah and then you would think oh the more properties you get it's way better you know you're way more happier you you're you're way better off which is pros and cons because i don't have the same chill level as i did then i could just take a load of days off and do nothing and everything would still be cash flowing and running smoothly but when you get to like 10 properties 15 20 it's like there's more work involved so get ready for that don't forget about that side and yeah. i think having the right team is so important i could not do this without my team i probably could but it would be stress yeah <laughs> so like i've got a pa a uh, pretty much full-time pa and i've got other people in my team so it definitely helps to keep the stress levels low so i can chill out go on holiday if i want to you don't want to be a prisoner to your own business mm. yeah that's great amazing so anything that we've not said anything you want to share with the audience any any last minute yeah. advice you want to give people before um i just want to say <clears throat> jack thank you for bringing me on and for being authentic i've watched a load of your content and i feel like you've got the right voice when you're explaining stuff you're not being fake you're being real about it so yeah just keep doing what you're doing thank you amazing appreciate that luigi you've got a youtube channel you've got social media platforms you do joint ventures, you do training, you're out there, you're doing the work. How can people get in touch with you if they want to? Yeah, so social media, um, keep in mind on Instagram, I've got a load of fake accounts, people making these fake accounts for me. So be wary of that. Well, my Instagram is LN Capital. And then my YouTube channel is LN Capital, or just type in Luigi Newton. And yeah, people can contact me, sorry, via email lncapital at outlook.com or just uh, reach out through Instagram. Amazing, amazing. If anyone's interested in joint venturing, make sure you get in touch with either of us. We'd love to do some deals. Great. Thanks, Luigi. Thanks so much no for your props. time. I think you offer loads of value from your experience, like you say, the mistakes that you've made, but also the incredible successes. You've partnered with loads of people to build something that's really, really impressive in a short period of time. Not many people have the dreams that you have and actually act on them to turn them into reality so yeah. well done to you for, thank you, mate. for going out that. taking action and um thank you so much for being here today yeah no problems thank you jack
Thanks for checking out the podcast. If you enjoyed the show, then make sure that you click the subscribe button and also hit the bell notification so you don't miss an upload. We're on YouTube, but we're also on all podcast platforms like Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Also, don't forget to check out the link in the description if you're interested in finding out more about the property investment education that I provide.